The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to APS webinars. The title of today's webinar is the 2015 APS Bridge Program Request for Proposals. I'm Elizabeth Hook, and I'll be your host for today's broadcast. Thank you for joining us. APS webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of individuals who can offer insight into physics careers, educational programs, and professional development for students, working physicists, and educators. Today's presentation features Dr. Ted Hodap and Dr. Brian Beckford. Ted and Brian will be providing information on the proposal process for new bridge sites and will describe tactics for writing a competitive proposal. After Ted finishes his presentation, the remainder of the program will belong to you for our question and answer session. Because of the number of people attending this webinar, we are only accepting text questions. If you want to ask a question, please type it into the questions panel located on the right side of your screen. You may submit questions through this panel at any time during the webinar, and we'll try and answer all of your questions at the end. We'll do our best to cover all of the questions that you submit, but we want to apologize in advance if we're unable to cover everything. Finally, a link to the recording of today's presentation will be emailed to you after the event and will be made available on the APS website the Bridge Program Request for Proposals page. Please allow us 24 hours for the video to upload. Moderating the discussion today will be Brian Beckford, Program Manager for the APS Bridge Program. Prior to coming to APS, Brian was granted a PhD in nuclear physics at Tohoku University in Sendai, Japan, and received his master's and bachelor's degrees in physics from Florida International University. And with that, I will turn things over to you, Brian. Thank you, Elizabeth. Today we have Ted Hodap joining us to talk about the APS Bridge Program and to describe how to obtain funding. Dr. Theodore Hodap is the Director of Education and Diversity for the American Physical Society. In addition to administering programs related to education and diversity at APS, Ted also provides leadership for the APS Bridge Program, the Physics Teacher Education Coalition, and the Conferences for Undergraduate Women in Physics. With that, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Hoda, Ted, to go ahead and start his presentation and inform us more about the APS Bridge Program. Thanks, Brian, um, and welcome to the uh, webinar, and I hope you all can see this. Um, we've got some slides up here we'll show you. And just as I mentioned, um, the slides will be available afterwards uh, if you want to take a look at any of the data that's on those. And um, we'll also uh, uh, hope to answer all your questions. So if you have questions that are that come up as the as things are proceeding, please type them in and we'll get to them as we as we go along. Um, so once again, thanks for joining us and uh, welcome. So um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the bridge program. Um, I'm going to first give you a very brief history of why the APS has gotten involved in this. Um, started back in about 2008 when a group of people got together to start to think a little bit more about what was the next steps that the American Physical Society should take to improve diversity uh, within the physics community more broadly. And the result of that was a statement. APS uses statements to um, affirm the uh, actions that its members want to take and to stand behind the kind of ideals that we, we as a society uh, represent. So the joint diversity statement uh, came up, it was passed by the APS Council and Executive Board and became part of our, our statements. Um, in that process, a member of the Executive Board you know, basically stood up and said, hey, we've got to do something beyond just making statements. Statements are a good starting point, but let's take something else. And so they tasked our office um, in education diversity with thinking about what would be the next step for that. And the, uh, the result of that was to think a little bit about where are the biggest needs that uh, exist within the community? And then more specifically, where are the actions that the American Physical Society could take in conjunction with physics departments that would, uh, that would result in a significant change for the, for the physics culture in general? So let me start by just telling you a little bit about, or showing you a little bit about some of those statistics. This is a plot of the number, or actually the fraction or percentage of African-American physics majors and other majors in the science and math fields. As you can see, the red line is the number of physics majors. 
and that number has been going down. Um, back in 1995, it was a little about 4%, may have reached something on the order of 5%, but as you can see, it's been sloping down since then, uh, down below uh, 3% now. And not only has the fraction gone down, but the actual number of students has gone down from about 182 back in 95 to about 160 uh, in 2012, and the most recent statistics we have. This data is from the uh, Department of Education's um, uh, data source called IPEDS. And we're not alone in this trend. As you can see, almost every other discipline in science and math is kind of similarly afflicted. And as you can see, also the black dotted line at the top shows you what the population has been, what's been going on in the population, the U.S. population. And it's roughly constant. Now let me contrast that with what's going on with Hispanic Americans. The um, number of Hispanics has been going up dramatically and has been for many years. And in fact, the number of Hispanic physics majors has been going up too, um, basically tripling in the last uh, 16, 17 years or so. And the fraction is going up, so they're now above 5% of all of the undergraduate physics majors. This is U.S. citizens, by the way. The, um, so that's great. Um, the issue here is that, of course, the population has been going up. So is this just reflecting the population, or is it reflecting an actual gain? And the answer is uh, it's mostly reflecting the population gain, but there is a small uptick in the fraction if you normalize for that Hispanic population as well. So things are getting a little bit better. But that's the undergraduate issue. And if you see that, if you add up Hispanics and African Americans, which constitute most of the underrepresented minorities, that's about 500 students total. That's a lot of people to interact with. And so trying to support that, it's definitely a goal of the APS, but it's difficult to kind of put our hands on um, a process that we would do to actually make a significant change in that number. So one of the other things we looked at was the graduate population. So here's a look at. Uh, underrepresented minority, URM, physics PhDs. The blue line at the bottom shows you the fraction of U.S. citizens who are URM designated who are getting PhDs, and it's about 5 to 6 percent, and it has been, for the last decade, pretty much unchanged. And you can see the, uh, the population has actually uh, gone up as well, mostly because of the change in Hispanics. Um, I haven't included Native American uh, in my conversations, but they're included in this, in this graph. Uh, we, we consider, and because of the way the U.S. Census gathers data, we gather data on um, African American, Hispanic American, and Native American. So our goal, as we saw it, is, so the couple things to take away here. Number one is the numbers have not changed really in the last decade. The blue line is roughly flat. Number two, the difference between where the black line, or the black arrow sits, and where the red arrow sits, it's uh, from 5 to 6 percent to about 9 to 10 percent. That number of students, actually, because you can see there's 52 granted in 2010, is about 30 students. And so this seems like a number which we might actually be able to have an impact on. And I'll just draw that number 30 to your attention because we're, come, we're going to come back to that in a, in a moment. So if we could increase every year the number of URM PhDs given, granted in the United States, by 30, we would basically erase this what I will call achievement gap for underrepresented students uh, at the PhD level. So that's our goal, and that was the goal set out by the Bridge Program. So we went to the NSF, and the NSF agreed that this was a good idea, and they gave us some money to start to address this. These are the three basic goals of the Bridge Program. Increase within the next decade the fraction of physics PhDs awarded to underrepresented minorities, um, and make sustainable, sustainable Bridge Programs model bridge programs to do that and then disseminate these things. So those are kind of the basic goals. A lot of people involved in this. So I'll just kind of show you a screen of some of the uh, individuals here. Um, and uh, so first of all, we have a National Advisory Committee. Uh, the chair of that is Cherry Murray, who's a former APS president and now a dean at uh, Harvard. Um, but a lot of people who've been involved in these kinds of things throughout, we have representatives from the National Society of Black Physicists and the National Society of Hispanic Physicists. We have student representatives there. Um, funding comes from the National Science Foundation, thank you, NSF, um, and also from the American Physical Society. As a part of this, we also created an Architects Council, and I'm going to draw your attention to the names on this list. These are the leaders at each of the bridge sites that currently exist, and I'll go through those again and again. This, these names will be available to you, but 
uh, Columbia, MIT, Michigan, and Fisk Vanderbilt were existing sites. We have instituted or established four other sites right now, Ohio State, Mich um, University of South Florida, Florida State, and uh, Cal State Long Beach. Uh, and those individuals are people that we would encourage you to contact as you're thinking about uh, becoming a bridge site because they've done this for Today, but uh, and Bushers, I think, in the background as well. Arlene um, and Monica here at APS, plus a number of researchers, have been helping us with various issues. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about what we see as kind of the evolving nature of the bridge program. We do a couple of basic things. Number one is that we APS uh, acts as kind of a super recruiter of underrepresented students. Um, and so we're uh, working with the uh, um, almost all of the graduate departments to get them to encourage students who they were not able to accept into their graduate programs to, um, to, to have them um, uh, apply to become a bridge program student. So we have a, an application process that works during the spring. We go out to all of the, the graduate programs. We also go out to all the undergraduate programs. And we know from data that we've gathered on this that um, uh, students are almost all the students are finding out about the bridge program through their advisors. And so we're trying to reach them as many ways as possible. Second thing that we've done here is that we've established bridge sites, which is what this RFP is about. And I'll just take, uh, we'll take, we'll take that apart a little bit more in a future slide here. But basically, students spend two years um, at the institution, uh, sometimes or oftentimes in a master's degree program at the institution, uh, even if they have a PhD program or at a master's institution doing a master's degree. They take advanced undergraduate courses typically in the first year or some grad level courses, get active in research and mentoring, um, and then there's a lot of integration there. And we pay for a good portion of that first year through the, the funds that we've got through the National Science Foundation. The second year, they're basically a full-blown full graduate student. If they're at a PhD institution, they're taking grad courses um, and their research is underway. And that would be the year that they would actually apply possibly or likely to that institution, but possibly also to other institutions. We don't limit them, but most students are staying, if they're in a PhD, granting institution, they're staying at that institution. Uh, for the ones who are at master's degree institutions, then they're in their second year of their master's program and they may be then thinking about applying to a PhD program on graduation with their master's. One of the things that was a, a delightful surprise is that we had many, many more students apply to this than we could actually uh, accommodate into the bridge program. And so we've now titled these students affiliated institutions and affiliated students. We had this year 69 graduate programs take a look at our uh, additional students that we couldn't accommodate. Um, 22 of those students got offers this year. And so um, we'll, we'll take apart some of those numbers again in a future slide. One of the things that we're doing, and, and I'll explore this a little bit more, is, is helping these, student, these institutions who are taking these students become uh, what we're going to be entitled in partnership institutions. It's not really the focus of the RFP, but I'll just mention it. We don't provide support for those students, but uh, we're acting kind of as the, as the nexus for the, their applications and helping them apply to many different institutions. And that's, we've, we've talked to a number of students who have reported that this really has helped them get in to find a match for a good graduate program. So we're very happy about that. We monitor the progress of all the students and we have a research agenda, which is taking a look at admission standards, something about exit pathways and the impact of the GRE on admissions. So, as I mentioned before, there are eight sites now that do bridge programs in physics. They're all a little bit different. Um, the longest standing one is the one at Vanderbilt in conjunction with Fisk. They, have a, they actually have a program in which they go between those two universities, starting at Fisk and then ending at Vanderbilt. Um, none of the rest of them work in the same way, and so it's, they have a unique geographic location in which they're connected. Um, Columbia takes students in. Uh, at MIT takes students from their summer research program, and Michigan State uh, takes students in to their applied physics program. 
We also now have instituted these four places, Cal State Long Beach, Florida State, Ohio State, and South Florida. You should contact us and say, I'm thinking about doing this. Who should I talk to? And we'll, we will uh, let you know who we think might be the best one. We're going to add, we have money to add two more sites, uh, which we'll be doing right now. And uh, we provide three years of funding for that. So in the bridge program in general, there are three levels of participation. The bridge site is the one that the RFP is about. And I'll just mention the other two briefly. Uh, membership institutions, you should be a membership institution to become a bridge site. It's free. You have to have a letter from your chair. Uh, we also provide you some discount. And the only thing we ask is that we get an annual reporting uh, piece from you about uh, participation at your institution. So open to everybody. Uh, this RFP is associated with the bridge site question. You have to be a graduate degree granting institution. You can be either a master's or PhD. Um, you have to be able to provide bridging experiences for the students between this undergraduate and doctoral degree. We pay some fraction of what it costs to actually have the student come to your institution, but not the entire cost. And I want to make a, underline that point. Um, and our success and our choosing of these sites is going to be based on the success of these students to matriculate and then successfully complete PhD programs. And then finally, I'll just mention partnership institution, which is something that we're just instituting now. And this is going to be basically a set of places that will accept students into their program. So this might be places that are getting students from uh, um, either from a bridge program in which the student did not stay there, either because it was a master's degree program and they can't finish a PhD there, like Cal State Long Beach, or because they chose a different field um, than is maybe available at one of the PhD granting institutions or the student wanted to leave. So these are, we're putting in process an approval process that uses the APS Committee on Minorities. And as a part of this, uh, partnership institutions will get access um, to our pool of students that we recruit for graduate programs and we'll advertise the web program advertise these graduate programs on our website but we expect that these sites will follow the basic guidelines of bridge programs which includes appropriate mentoring progress monitoring and so on all right let me just turn now to the bridge site eligibility and we'll talk a little bit about the money as well um, so first of all the um, um, you have to be a, you have to be able to grant a master's or a doctor degree. You have to be able to absorb two students, on average per year. So one of the things that I think, um, one of the reasons why some sites were not selected in the past is they had very small programs. They're graduating one or two PhD students a year, and they said, well, this would be a way for us to increase the number. Changing from one or two, doubling that number, for example, or tripling that number per year to our external reviewers seem like a um, not a good bet really and so one of the things about it is that you need to be able to demonstrate if you're a growing program for example that you can actually absorb those students and that you have adequate funding internally to be able to support them as doctoral students or as master's students and so that absorption of those students is a critical piece Second is that you need institutional support and commitment, and this has to come from the physics department, and it has to come from above the physics department at the administrative level. So uh, as an example, at the Ohio State, the leader of the program there, John Peltz, um, asked for and got a unanimous uh, vote of approval by the faculty before they applied to this program to say, yes, we want to do this kind of thing. This is something that we think is important to do. And I uh, also mentioned that you do need to be a member institution. And again, that's quite straightforward. All right, so for bridge sites, um, you can follow existing models or a new one that seems well suited to your institution. Um, probably you're going to have better luck with existing models because they're, they're kind of, they are basically aggregation of good practice. And uh, But if you've got a good idea, we're certainly open to hearing that. The, uh, most of them have followed a master's degree that is directed toward a PhD. So it's not a terminal master's, but what we've called a transitional master's. Uh, Cal State Long Beach certainly does that, but this is also happening at other institutions as well. Um, I'll mention the post-baccalaureate model, which is what is going on at Columbia. 
and at MIT. There the students come in, they uh, take courses not in a degree track, but it prepares them to enter into a PhD program. And that works for their economic and the uh, logistical model of those institutions. And we're certainly open to that or other things. I'll mention one other program we've seen, which is also one run out of MIT, but in biology, which has students working in the biotech industry. Um, so they actually get an industrial experience as well. And that's also a post-baccalaureate model. You must be able to build a sustainable model. So we're not looking for something that um, you do when you have APS funding, then you stop doing afterwards. You have to be demonstrating how you're going to be able to do this when we're done. And so that means you need to have institutional support. If you can't get your institution to support or get behind this, it's probably not a good choice for what's going on. You need to be able to take two students per year on average. And I will say that almost all of our sites are taking actually more than two students. And that's part of the sustainability. They've found other funds internally to support other students. And they've been able to accept more than the two students that they promised that they would take. And I would say all but one of the students, yeah, I think almost all of them are taking many more. Um, our success is going to be measured against student progress. And so um, we're looking really to get almost every single one of these students through into the PhD program. And I think ultimately that's going to be, that, that then takes a little bit of extra time to make sure you pay attention to those students and make sure they get the right amount of support they are to make the transition that's going on. Um, for a master's program, if you're a master's program and you want to become a bridge site, you must be able to show how you're actually increasing your numbers, not just having APS, for example, pay for a couple of your students. And so that's a critical piece if you want to do that as a master's program. Um, you do not, and I'll, this last point I've added just recently is that you do not need to have a partner institution. The Fisk Vanderbilt program, which is well known, and I highly recommend people going and talking with uh, Kayvon Stassen or um, Arnold Berger, who are some of the leads there. Um, but they have this really cool interaction because the two sites are, inter are very close to each other. But you do not need that because we will actually provide the students to you through our recruitment process. So if you have the partner institution, that's great. Um, it, I don't know that it's going to be a particular advantage or disadvantage. I don't think so. Um, but we would say that we're work on, operating on a slightly different model as we go forward. OK, as a bridge site, there are a couple of key components that you must have in your site and in your program. You need to have um, a way to make an, an established way to do admissions that are going to pay attention to these students. That is, uh, if you're a standard PhD granting institution, it might be different than the process that you use um, to accept students into your PhD program. One of the things I will tell you is that the students don't appear to you until basically until April 15th. And so this happens after the standard application process. And so you need to describe in your proposal how you're going to make that, uh, how you're going to uh, make your decisions and the criteria that you'll use and the process by which you go at. Uh, you can find more information on the APS website about that. But basically we're looking for uh, people who are going to be looking for students who are who are obviously most of these students applied to other programs and did not get in. So how do you actually then deal with that? Um, financial support, how do you do that? How are you providing that? We provide $20,000 per student total. So that's for the total two years to get $20,000. Not $20,000 per year, but $20,000 total. And that means that if they're going to be there for two years and you're going to provide a $20,000 stipend, you'll need to come up with the second $20,000 uh, internally. So thinking about how you put on financial support and then detailing that in your proposal, basically. Um, under coursework, I'll say that the, a critical thing here is how you do that initial induction and advising. And one of the things that we've seen is, at least with some students, is that students say, oh yeah, I'm ready for graduate level e and I took the undergraduate e and and I did fine. And we find out that, in fact, they took the grad undergraduate e &M, but they just did OK. And it was not nearly at the rate that the graduate e &M is going at. And so they get into a graduate e &M course, and they flounder, and it doesn't work well. So um, paying attention to how the students get into those courses and making sure that they get into the right courses. And if they need to switch in week two, 
that they get switched. So a part of that is thinking about that initial induction process, getting them to the right courses so that they make an appropriate and they get students, most of these students are going to be moving to a new place, perhaps a place where they don't have family support anymore in nearly the way that they've had it previously. And so finding different ways to interact with these students and make sure that you're kind of keeping track of that. We had one student who um, had health problems but didn't know that he could go to the health service to get help. And our site leader found this out, got the student help, and then the student did much better in the second semester. So they're Things like that where you need to pay attention, pretty close attention to these students and some very amazing stories on that that have turned into great successes. The um, um, progress monitoring I'll just mention because this is, has to happen right away. Week one, week two, first assignment coming back. How is the student doing? Discussions with the instructors, if necessary, providing tutors to make sure the student does well. So that's a, a critical component. Also, kind of how do you induct them into the community of graduate students? In almost all cases, these students have not seen themselves specifically as bridge students. In fact, some of them, you know, didn't even know they were kind of considered that by, their, by the faculty. They thought of themselves as graduate students, and that's the way we would like them to see themselves. They're coming in, they have a little different support uh, mechanism, but we want to make sure that they get involved in the system, that they get, in, get inducted into that so that they make the right kind of study questions. And then research is appropriate. Um, maybe not in the first year, but maybe so, depending on your, your, and how do they get introduced to research groups and things like that. If they're an outlier in your program, how do they help get into that? And finally, how do they transition into the PhD, whether it's at your own institution, or in other words, you have to have a plan for that. The budgets, basically, uh, we provide $20,000, as I mentioned, per student, uh, up to two students per year. And you need to provide the rest of the money, whatever uh, comes in for that. And that's part of this sustainability. We also provide $10,000 per year in operations and some site travel for, travel for the site leader. And we provide each bridge student with uh, one trip to uh, a professional meeting as appropriate. We don't allow overhead on the student stipends or on the travel, and the awards go for three years. Um, the students that we recruit have to have a bachelor's degree in physics or something fairly close to that. They must be a US citizen or permanent residence. And they either did not apply to a graduate program or they applied and were not accepted. And I would say about two thirds of our students applied but not get accepted or were not accepted. And about a third of them actually did not apply for various reasons. Some because they, did, they looked at their GRE score and they said, I'll never get in. And in fact, they did get in. So you have to be committed to improving, the student has to be committed to improving diversity and meet the individual requirements of the institution. Um, you can't currently be, to be a bridge fellow, you can't be currently enrolled or have an existing physics degree. So that's just a little bit about the students that you would be seeing at a bridge program. All right, so now a little bit on site selection criteria. We, the bridge program, are looking for a diverse set of institutions, and diverse has a lot of components to it. Um, part of it is geographic diversity, part of it is institutional type, part of it is institutional programs, we're looking to kind of make sure that we have op um, options. It might be the, the types of degrees that are offered, or the types of specialties and subfields that are offered, that sort of thing. You have to have a robust graduate program. This can't be a program that's just getting started. I don't think that's going to make a good match for who we are. You have to be able to provide sustainability and show a, a deep commitment to these students. And you need to be able to follow demonstrated good practices. And we'll outline those for you, but those are, those, are, uh, those are pretty clear, and we can talk to you about those kinds of things. And we have a pretty clear way of communicating that. You need to be committed to building diversity in your program. You probably should have comprehensive institutional programs to support the students, because not all the support happens within the physics department. The department has to be behind this. And you need to be committed to basically 100% success of these students. We know that not every student will be successful, but we want to see as much as possible. We like to see every single student successful. So as, the, as the, the review team looks at these proposals, these are the kinds of things they're considering. And they're trying to consider how do we make sure that with the limited number of sites that we can establish that these are going to be the successful ones. Here's a bit about the process. 
Um, right now, there's a, we've opened up, there's a three-page pre-proposal that's due. That comes due on the 3rd of October at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, it's a PDF. We don't want to see paper. Do not make it longer than three pages. Anything longer than three pages, do not put a title page on it. Just have three pages. That's it. And that's what people will read. If you have five pages, we'll only read the first three. Um, we then go on to review those. We have an internal and external panel that looks at all those proposals. And then for the ones that, are, that seem to be good set, we'll ask them to go to a full proposal. So we don't want you to take a lot of time if you're not in the right, in the right place to, to submit a full proposal. And so uh, we will review these. And if this looks like it's in good stead, we'll then ask you to go forward in mid-October to do a full NSF-style 15-page proposal. Those are due on the 12th of December, again, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And you know you want to follow all of the standard rules that you follow when you submit an NSF proposal. If it's not to the NSF, it'll be to us. And again, we follow basically NSF-style review descriptions with some minor differentiation. We have a, a review panel that meets early in January. And then we talk to sites, and we do site selection by early March. We typically go and visit some of the sites to make sure we understand what's going on at the institution. We'll then provide by April the uh, student applications. Funding will start in the summer, and then we have an annual meeting, which will, in this coming year will be in October of 2015. So those are critical dates there for you. So here's a little bit about how what's happened so far uh, within the project. We promised uh, the NSF we would do about four students in the first year, eight, and eventually about 10 or 12 students. Um, so the blue lines are what we have said we can do. And as you can see, we're way, way, way more than that. We did 27 students this last year uh, who got into programs. And mostly that's so of that 27, let me break that down for you a little bit. So we had about 45 applications coming in through the recruiting process. 18 of those students went into bridge programs directly. So five at Long Beach, two at Florida State, four went to Fisk Vanderbilt. Uh, we're also recruiting for all of the other bridge programs. If they want to see the program, they want to see the students. Ohio State took three and South Florida took four students. So again, these are um, of the four that we support. We don't support Fisk Vanderbilt directly, but of the four that we do support, you can see that many of them took many more students than we could actually provide funding for. And that was a, a key aspect in making that award to those institutions that showed that they were going to be able to do, uh, they were going to be able to sustain what's going on and, in fact, build on it. Now, we had 27 other uh, applications. And of those 27, um, actually 22 of them, of the 27, got offers. Eight of them we know now are attending other, what we're, what we're now calling affiliated site, which will, should be partnership sites soon. Um, 14 other students got offers. We only found five students who got no offers. So many, many of these students are getting offers to go various places. We don't know some of them, whether some of those 14 are actually attending some other places. And we had eight students who uh, we know of the of those uh, of the 14, eight of them withdrew or were ineligible for support. Ineligible went to that's the student ineligibility criteria. Um, just report that almost all of the students are underrepresented minority, 93%. That's in both of our 2013 and our 2014 class. Uh, about two thirds are Hispanic and about a third are African American, and this reflects the demographics of undergraduate degree granting. And we're happy to say that, in fact, we exceed the fraction of uh, women who are coming in that. In physics right now, it's about 20%. We had 29% female. So let me um, end with this one graph here, which reflects something about the research program. And um, we've been looking at the GRE and the implications of the GRE. If you haven't seen this graph before, um, GREs, you can score between 400 and 1,000. So this is a, a, the impact of a cutoff score. So if you accept no lower than 400, well, everybody gets above a 400. And so you accept all of the students there. If you accept no lower than 1,000, nobody gets above 1,000, so you get zero there. So I've just picked one number in the middle, 650, although many places have GRE scores that are much higher than that. In a GRE score of 650, 61 percent of the Asian applicants who took the GRE score above a 650. White applicants, 44 percent. Hispanics, 34 percent. And you can see that only 9 percent of the African American students who took the GRE scored on 650 or above. And that is part of the issue that we're trying to kind of recognize is that the GRE 
is not necessarily a good um, indicator of what's going on. And we have some other data that support that. And part of our research efforts are to think about those kinds of things. So, We have a, a bunch of good questions. Uh, one of the questions that came in, and I think we should start with this, is there's a question about whether women are considered as an underrepresented minority group. Right. And so we get this question quite a lot. And women are underrepresented in physics. It's no doubt about that. This project, the APS Bridge Program specifically, has been focusing on underrepresented minorities. and so. Um, while we understand and fully appreciate the fact that women are not represented uh, well in physics, the goal of this project has been specifically to work with students of color. And so that means U.S. citizens and Hispanic American, African American, or Native American or Pacific Islander uh, are the students we consider. So working to increase the number of women is not specifically the action, and, and we would not support students. now. I will just say that the way that we get our applications, and this kind of brings up a, a broader question of how we do things, um, because it's federal funding, we can't limit who we spend money on. So we do not choose students based on race or, et race or ethnicity, or gender for that matter. And so, in fact, we have applicants, as I saw, as you saw, we had 93% of our applicants were in those categories of underrepresented minorities. 7% were not. We had a few Caucasian students, for example. Um, the, the upshot is that the way that we get that 93% is that we are very careful to target and market this program specifically for those students. But if another student applies and they meet the criteria, they can be accepted into the programs as well. But as far as the goals of the project, we are looking to increase the number of underrepresented minorities, and that's our specific goal. Okay, thank you. Before we go forward, I do want to encourage everyone that if you have any questions that come up as we're in the session, please feel free to go ahead and type those in into the question panel uh, box. Um, this is a question that someone asked and wanted to just get clarification on the funding. Uh, simply, you did speak about it, but you said funding would be over a three-year period. And the question is, is this a 20K per year for the students for this three-year period? So, good question, and it's a question we get quite often. So let's, uh, I'll just kind of give you a, a standard rough budget that we will provide to institutions. Um, so 20K goes per student, but not per student per year, just per student. So over a three-year period, you would take two students in each year. That would be a total of six students. And so six times 20,000 is $120,000. And so the total amount you'd get over the three-year period would be $120,000 to support six students. Now we also provide a little bit of money for uh, um, administrative help. That's about $10,000 per year, so that's another $30,000, and some travel. So a typical three-year grant is going to be on the order of $160,000, $170,000, something on that order. Um, but it's not $20,000 um, per year. So in other words, if you took a student and they're going to be there for two years, we would not provide you with $40,000. We provide you with $20,000. And so you will need to um, provide the funding for the second year if they're there. And I will just say that at most of the institutions, what's happening is that um, that first year is, is, is not, strangely enough, that's the bridge year. That's the year in which they will be taking courses that will be more aligned with perhaps taking advanced undergraduate courses, getting their math and physics uh, skill set up to speed. The second year, they're pretty much embedded in the graduate program, taking graduate level, e &M, quantum, and so forth. And so then you can kind of think of them as a graduate student, and then your institution should be supporting them as a graduate student, even if they're not technically in the graduate program uh, per se at that point. And that is kind of the approach that most of, this, most of the institutions that are bridge sites now are approaching this particular issue. So $20,000 per student, but not per student per year. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, again, most of these are clarification questions. You said it, you did mention about travel support, and there's a question about a clarification about what exactly does the travel support cover? 
Right. So um, there are two elements of the travel support. One is that we ask each of the site leaders, which are typically but not universally the directors of graduate studies uh, for the institution, um, to come to our annual meeting. So the so there would be support for that to bring that person to our annual meeting in October 2015 and in each of the subsequent years. And then we also provide um, support for each bridge student. So let's say you have a student and they want to go to the, say, the APS March meeting and make a presentation of research they've done. We will provide travel support for that one student, uh, for each of those students for one meeting while they're bridge, while they are a bridge uh, fellow. Um, so that's you know typically in something on the order of about a thousand dollars. I will mention one other thing that we have been doing, and we I, I presume that we will continue to do this, is that we find that many of the students um, are on the lower end of the economic scale of things, and making a transition to your university can be difficult. You know, they don't have enough money to buy a moving van or to pay a down payment on their or a rental deposit on their on their apartment. And so one of the things that we've been doing, which is unavailable to many of the sites, not all of them, um, is that we can make, a, make part of the $20,000 stipend available before the student actually shows up on campus as a kind of a travel support. So we reserve out $1,000, and we say, if you're interested in providing this to the student, we can make it available to them. That reduces their stipend for the rest of the year but it gives them this money to be able to make that uh, appropriate transition so that they can, um, they can get to your university, get set up, get an apartment, uh, rent, a, rent a van or whatever they need to do to get there, that sort of thing. And so we do make that service available uh, on a one-by-one -one basis. And I think we awarded it to of all the students that, that we supported. We supported, by the way, on this graph, we supported eight of those 27 students. So most of the students are being supported by other institutions. And I think three of the eight students we provided uh, with this $1,000 uh, stipend as well. Okay. Um, I have another great one for you. Can the institutions require the student to be a graduate teaching assistant? Oh, good question. Can they require them to be a GTA? Um, we certainly don't limit or regulate that particular thing. And so, uh, I think it's it's completely up to you on those kinds of things. Uh, the criteria with which which you would probably should consider is will this affect the uh, the student's likelihood of making the successful transition? And so, um, for example, you know we're providing money for the basically for the first year, and we know that you're going to be providing it after that. It's certainly reasonable and probably probably actually a good idea for the students to become TAs maybe in their second year. You might want to not have them be a TA in the first year just so that they can focus on their coursework, make sure they make that transition properly, make sure they're rolling on a full head of steam into the, into the coursework that they need to take, that sort of thing. And I will say that, um, although I mentioned that uh, many of the students take undergraduate physics courses, many of the students are actually taking graduate level courses in their first year. They're ready for some of those courses, maybe not all of them. And in a couple of cases, in fact, students are ready for all graduate courses. So it, it's, a, it's a mixed bag depending on the, the student's preparation, the type of institution, and the, and the quality of the institution they went to as an undergraduate. As, you know, did, the, did, you know, if they took uh, E&M from Griffiths, did it go through Chapter 22, or did they only go through Chapter 12? And so these things have an impact on, you know, what level of E&M they want to take when they get there. Uh, but I would say it's certainly possible for them to become a TA, um, but I would say the thing that you should consider uh, is, is this going to impact their, their uh, probability of success in completing graduate work. Thank you very much. I'd like to move on to something about uh, student recruiting, and what we have here is if an if institution is selected at a bridge site, from that point on, how is recruiting going to be handled for the bridge program? Is this something primarily handled by APS, or now will this be a requirement by a newly selected bridge site? Great question. Um, so originally, when we started the bridge program, we thought, OK, we want to both have the, the institution do recruiting and the bridge program do recruiting. 
but we have been so successful at doing this recruiting that we think we can actually do most of the recruiting for all of the sites. We have far more students than we can possibly seat in graduate programs throughout the country. And so we think we're actually able to, to gather a lot of students. Now that doesn't mean that you uh, shouldn't do recruiting if you'd like to. And in fact, we encourage that if you, if you think um, you want to encourage that because you're going to do recruiting for your own program anyway. But I will just say that uh, for bridge students, um, we think that we can provide all the students. In fact, we think that they should actually come through the bridge program application process for a variety of reasons. One of them, which is that we track all of the students. And so as we're trying to report the success of the project, broadly speaking, we need to know all of that information. And so even if you found a student and you think, oh, the student works out for that, um, they would probably need to go in and apply to the bridge program specifically on those kinds of things. So we would have the data that we would gather in the application process. Um, but I would say it's probably not required for you to go out and do recruiting. Uh, you probably get far more students than you actually need through our application process. Uh, our first year we got 28, 29 students. This year we got in the low 40s. Um, and we expect that the number will go up a little bit more, although because more and more people are hearing about it. Uh, I don't know what the asymptote is on that. My, my current prediction is somewhere in the 50, mid 50s to 60 perhaps per year. But, um, but I think in any case, even with the numbers we have so far, we have many more students that we can seat into these programs than we can actually, than there are seats available. And so, um, although and we certainly don't, uh, don't discourage recruiting, um, it's really not required in what you're doing for the bridge program specifically. Okay, uh, we're going to move forward. We have a couple more questions that I think we can get in here before our, our time, um, while we have a, some limited time left. And one has to do with, you were speaking about, um, and this has to do with faculty involvement. And basically the question is, what typical level of faculty involvement should be demonstrated? What are, what is, what are the panel reviewers going to be looking for specifically? Are there any specific numbers um, in terms of, what is going to make a uh, proposal rise to the top? Yeah, very good question. And so one of the things we don't want to see, and I'll just speak negatively first, and then I'll go to the positive side, is that we don't want to see a lone wolf come in and say, man, this would be great for my department. I'm going to apply to this thing, and hopefully everybody else will get behind me when we go forward. That's not the right approach to do this kind of thing. So it, you need to have the department saying, this is a good idea. and um, to do that, you need to get the support. One of the things that we've learned from, uh, there's another program in mathematics called the Math Alliance that does something similar but not quite the same as what we do. Um, and they have, a, they have a rubric of saying 10 to 15 percent of the tenured faculty have to be behind that. So if you're a department of 30 faculty, three to five minimum have to be kind of on board with this. And this is something we look for actually pretty, pretty systematically, that you're not just the director of graduate studies who think this is a good idea. You've got some professors who are going to be able to say, we want these students in our labs. We're going to be able to support and help with the mentoring. Uh, we need to stand behind this. Obviously, you need to have the chair who supports this. But oftentimes, the chair is not taking an active role in this program. And that's fine with us, too. We don't need to necessarily have the chair. But we do want to have the director of and um, uh, they lost the audio is it back in um, so uh, part of what's going on, um, so okay, let me start again here. Um, the, uh, sorry about the sound issue. The, what we're looking for is to make sure that we have a significant number of, a, a sufficient number of people in the department who can be able to take this thing forward. So our kind of rule of thumb, which we learned from the Math Alliance, is 10 to 15% of the tenured faculty. And so you can take, take that as kind of a, a rubric, but you need to have support of the faculty. And as I said, 
Uh, Ohio State had a vote, they had a unanimous vote of the faculty that this was a good idea. Not everybody in the faculty is, um, is doing this specifically, but there's enough of them behind it so that when, uh, when they need to have another person come to a meeting or when they need to think about what's going on, there are people that are informed and in the loop and kind of addressing the issues that might be seen by these students as they come into your program. It can't just be one person. So I would say use the 10 to 15 percent as kind of a, a minimum number. It can't just be a lone wolf person that says I'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do. It has to be a thing which the department, the, the department as a unit, has committed to this. And that there. And I, uh, let me add on one piece of this, which is to say that um, while the chair's support is required, the chair doesn't need to be the person who is pushing this kind of thing. But we do need to make sure that it is done, that there are faculty members who are supporting this and who are leading this effort. I think that if you have a senior lecturer, for example, doing this, you can rightly, and our, our review committees do this, rightly question about whether the senior lecturer is actually in a place to be able to affect departmental policy on the level that needs to happen. Are they going to be able to uh, change admission requirements for these students? Are they going to be able to argue for funds and things like that? And that typically comes from somebody who has a little bit more seniority. Now, it's not to say that you can't have a, a person who is from one of those positions lead these things, but you have to convince, I think, the readers of the proposal that you have the backing beyond that of, sufficient, of significant people uh, who are going to be able to, to sustain the project in the long term. And that's a critical aspect. And that's something that the review panel does look at very carefully. Brian, right. are you back there? Yes, okay. I'm just about to start, just making sure you're uh, completely answering the question. Um, and again, we do apologize for any sound issues. Uh, lastly, I think we should go with uh, something that came is what level of engagement with students in terms of mentoring and monitoring um, are, are should be detailed. What is going to be appropriate again to also make a proposal stand out? Proposal stands out. So proposal stand out in terms of a mentoring uh, mentoring sure. relationships. Is that right, Brian? Yes, in terms of a mentoring plan or, or what okay. you are outlining to engage with the students in terms of mentoring and progress uh, monitoring. Sure. Um, so uh, I'll refer to the kind of the good practices that we've seen at a bunch of universities and have been adapted by our bridge sites. <clears throat> um, you, uh, so I would say the first thing is is that um, let me take a drink of water here. You don't want to have a single person be the mentor. Um, the student needs to be able to um, turn to a variety of people, and so um, I would say a reasonable mentoring plan would include. Um, the site leader who is acting as kind of the, the overarching person um, in which um, the um, in which the um, the student can interact with they probably are going to be connected to a research group and so there should be the person who's leading that research group needs to be able to provide that mentorship because the students coming in you don't know um, we don't know exactly what the the degree of connection is going to be between the um, between that student and what's going on um, in the research lab. So that's an important piece of this. Uh, we usually recommend somebody who is kind of keeping aware of the social interaction and fabric of what's going on. At one of our sites, for example, um, the graduate students the, um, who came in through the, the standard graduate student admissions process were saying, well, what's the deal with these bridge students here? And so that required an intervention by the site leader to, to bring people together and have a conversation about it. And everything turned out fine. But um, having somebody who's got their eye on the social fabric of the graduate, organ, the graduate students and how they interact, that's a critical piece to that. We don't stipulate a specific mentoring thing, but I would say, A, it can't be a single individual, and B, you need to cover the basic ideas of uh, making sure that you've developed a relationship with the students so that, so that when they have issues, they can turn to you. With regard to progress monitoring, I think our, the lessons that we have learned and that we have seen from existing programs uh, says you need to be involved right away. 
So week one, week two, probably no later than that. In some places that, were, that had taken some of our affiliated students, um, they didn't check in until the midterm and already the student was doing so poorly that they couldn't salvage the first semester. That's a bad foot to get started on. Is A in class, attentive, is doing well on the homework, um, and then having a conversation early on with the student to say, you know, how is this working? Have you connected up with the study groups that working are working in the class? That sort of thing. So um, we're looking for uh, an integration into the system, an attention to the student, and especially in that first time, that, those early days when they enter into what's going on. That's, that's going to be a critical piece of that. So I think that's basically it. Okay, I think that is all the time we have today for the official webinar. Um, thanks, Ted and Brian, for a wonderful discussion. Um, if any of y'all have questions that you think of after we finish the broadcast or that we didn't get to, please feel free to send an email to webinars at APS.org, and we will pass along your questions and to the speakers so that they can comment on them. Slides of this presentation, as well as a video recording, uh, will be available on the Bridge Program RFP page afterwards. And you'll also receive an email from us containing a link to the recording of today's presentation. Lastly, as you sign off today, um, in order to help us continue to develop quality webinar presentations, please help us by taking a moment to complete this short survey as you exit the webinar today. So this wraps up today's event, and we hope you'll join us again next time.